good morning so in the last class uh, we had uh, discussed regarding bls and what are the components of bls so today uh, we will proceed with advanced cardiac life support as i told what do you mean by bls bls means it is basic life support it is a combination of rescue breaths and chest compression given to a victim of cardiac arrest so we have not used any equipments other than a barrier device or a back mass ventilation device or an AED or a defibrillator that is available. So we haven't done anything now. So basically ACLS is a continuation of your BLS itself. So you have started the compression, you have called for help and some one person might have come for help with an AED or without an AED. So the moment you get an AED you have to connect and you have to see what is the rhythm and you have to wait for the instructions from the AED. So that is what you have to do. So now what is basically ACLS? ACLS deals with, you have a victim of cardiac arrest. Now we have to see what to maintain the, how to maintain the airway. You have to maintain the airway. So we have done back mass ventilation, whether an advanced airway is needed or not. So advanced airway we have not discussed in BLS. So advanced airway means, what is meant by advanced airway? Either a supraglottic airway device or a definite airway. Definite airway means a cuffed to tube inside the trachea. So either an supraglottic airway device or an endotracheal intubation is needed or not, we will do, if needed, we will do in advanced cardiac life support. Sometimes after achieving return of spontaneous circulation, that means the patient had a cardiac arrest and you have started the CPR and you have done back mass ventilation, maybe after you get a return of spontaneous circulation, that means after getting the pulse only, we might go ahead with advanced airway. So advanced airway can be done in between your ACLS or after achieving your uh, rhythm. That is a return of spontaneous circulation. It can be done. But you have to remember that if you feel, okay, if you feel that the cause of cardiac arrest is due to hypoxia or due to breathing problem. So securing an airway is a priority. So without securing the airway, the patient might not come back. So return of spontaneous circulation might not happen. Suppose it is a hyperkalemic cardiac arrest, maybe a back mass ventilation is enough. Suppose you have a patient who has drowned and he has been rescued onto the floor. So there, the primary reason for cardiac arrest might be hypoxia. So at that time, intubation is a priority. So in general, you have to understand is that whenever possible, you can intubate. If you have adequate skill sets available, you can go for an advanced airway. If you don't have that, if you don't have that time to do an advanced airway, you, can, you don't have a skill set, you can continue back, back mass ventilation and after achieving the return of spontaneous circulation also you can intubate. But it all depends upon why this patient is having a cardiac arrest. <clears throat> so the one important thing, airway management will come. So advanced airway management will come in ACLS and we haven't discussed regarding any of the drugs that we have used. So all the drugs that you needed to use will come in advanced cardiac life support, like drugs like adrenaline, amiodarone, lignocaine and all these drugs, these are the three major drugs that you need to do. So these drugs will come in advanced cardiac life support. So advanced cardiac life support basically deals with what? Advanced airway management and drugs and next important thing is that you have to look for the reversible causes of cardiac arrest. You have to look for why this patient is having a cardiac arrest. So why, what are the reasons behind this cardiac arrest? So we have got some reversible causes of cardiac arrest, you have to investigate accordingly and you have to look for the reversible cause of cardiac arrest. So this is what is basically meant by advanced cardiac life support. Advanced cardiac life support is basically what it is the continuation of your BLS. So we have a, you have started with BLS. So BLS you have done your back mass ventilation, back mass ventilation plus CPR you have done and after that the moment a defibrillator or an AED is available you have connected to that and further you have what all things you need to do? One is advanced airway management. Advanced airway management. Two important thing is drugs. That what all drugs that you need and you have to look for the causes of cardiac arrest. So this is what is basically what you have to do in advanced cardiac life support. So these are the things that we have to cover. Okay. So <clears throat> we have to remember that the moment the patient is started with CPR. So that is the first thing you have started the patient on CPR at a ratio of 30 is to 2. So that is one cycle of CPR. 
and moment a defibrillator is available. So I have just stopped. I will not be discussing regarding AED. AED is basically for lay person. So what we have in our hospital or you have to use is a defibrillator. So moment a defibrillator is available. Defibrillator is available. You have to connect to that to the patient. So defibrillator is connected. Word to connect. That is the next important thing. So we have the, we just take this as the chest wall. So this is the right nipple, left nipple. This is the sternum. So overall you need to connect the uh, leads. You have to connect right, red, yellow and green. So these are the three areas where you need to connect your defibrillator leads. You need to connect to red, yellow and green. So these are the three areas where you need to connect and you have to see what is the type of rhythm this patient is having. Now we should know what how to differentiate between a shockable rhythm. This is a term that we frequently use as shockable rhythm and non-shockable rhythm. So I'll be using these terms very frequently. You have to know what you mean by a shockable rhythm, what you mean by a non-shockable rhythm. So you have to understand moment the defibrillator is connected, you have connected to the defibrillator. We will discuss the defibrillator in a separate class. So right now what you have done, we have connected a defibrillator to the patient and in the monitor, so something like this you will have. In the monitor, you have to see whether it is a shockable rhythm or whether it is a non-shockable rhythm. So that is the next thing. So we have started CPR. The moment that you have started 30 to 2 compression, your help has come. You have to decide whether to give shock or not to give shock. For that reason, you should know how to differentiate between a shockable rhythm and a non-shockable rhythm. So basically, you remember that shockable rhythms and non-shockable rhythms. These are the two entities. So shockable rhythms, shockable, shockable and non-shockable, non-shockable rhythm. So which all rhythms we can shock, which all rhythm we cannot shock. Remember that pulseless, I am putting a P for that ventricular tachycardia, pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. These are the two shockable rhythms. So what are the shockable rhythms? Pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation and non-shockable rhythms. Anything other than this is a non-shockable rhythm. So what are the other rhythms that you can have commonly? You can have something called as PEA. That means pulseless electrical activity. PEA means what? Pulseless. Pulse. There is no pulse. Pulseless electrical electrical activity. Pulseless electrical activity is what is called as PEA. So you have basically shockable rhythm and non-shockable rhythm. So shockable rhythms are pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation and commonly the non-shockable rhythm what you see is PEA and there is another one called as A systole. A systole. So these are all examples of non-shockable rhythm. So we have to know how these things will look like. Now we have to understand how to differentiate between a ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, PEA and AC study. So that is what we have to understand now. Without knowing that, there is no point in going further. So what you have to understand that in a normal ECG, you have an P wave, QRS complex and an ST segment. So we have a P wave, QRS complex, and an ST segment. So this is what you will have in a normal ECG. This is how a normal ECG will look like. So whenever you have a tachycardia, you understand that you can have two types of tachycardia. So one type of tachycardia is called as narrow QRS tachycardia. Narrow QRS tachycardia. So tachycardia, we can basically divide into two types. That is narrow complex tachycardia and white complex tachycardia. Narrow QRS tachycardia and white complex tachycardia. So basically, <laughs> depending upon your QRS, whatever you have seen here, you can have narrow QRS tachycardia and white complex tachycardia. White complex. So what do you mean by narrow complex? Normally, this QRS complex should be three small squares. Three small squares. If it is less than three small squares, we call it as narrow QRS. If it is more than three small squares, we call it as white complex tachycardia. So it is pretty simple. More than three, it is white complex. Less than three, it is narrow QRS. So what you have to see? First thing, you have to see the QRS complex and see whether the QRS complex is within 
three small squares. If it is less than three small squares and there is a tachycardia, what we can call narrow QRS tachycardia. When the QRS is width and it is more than three small squares, we can call it as wide QRS from tachycardia. So it is, otherwise you can remember 120 milliseconds. So 30 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds is uh, one small square. So more than 120 milliseconds. So simple thing, you remember three small squares. That is more than enough. Less than three small squares, it is narrow. narrow. More than three small squares, it is wide from the tachycardia. So what you have decided is that you have a patient who has come with tachycardia. So after having tachycardia, we have to see whether it is an. So I put tachy here, tachy. So tachy we have divided into two. Narrow QRS and wide QRS. Wide complex tachycardia. Wide QRS tachycardia, whatever we can be. I am just saying it as wide complex tachycardia. So in narrow QRS, what all things can happen? You can have two things here. You can have regular and irregular. Regular, the tachycardia can be regular and it can be irregular also. So what we have done, we have a patient with, who is having tachycardia. When will you call the patient is having tachycardia? When the heart rate is more than 100, we call it as tachycardia. And above 100, if you are seeing any tachycardia, we have to say whether it is a narrow QRS tachycardia or whether it is a wide QRS tachycardia. If it is a narrow QRS tachycardia, the next thing what you have to see whether it is a regular tachycardia or whether it is irregular tachycardia. Similarly, here also we can have irregular and regular. So we have started heart rate more than 100. So heart rate more than 100, narrow QRS or whether it is wide QRS and regular or irregular. Now we will divide each of this tachycardia further and we will see what are the different types of tachycardia. So we have to understand that when in an ACLS, you have to understand whether it is a shockable rhythm or whether it is a non-shockable rhythm. So to understand what is a ventricular fibrillation and what is ventricular tachycardia, you should know to recognize it. So how will you recognize it? It's what I am going to teach you. So what you have to understand is that you have seen a patient with tachycardia and you have seen the next thing it is QRS, wide or narrow. Narrow QRS, you can have regular and irregular. Now under narrow QRS, we will see what are the other options. Okay, so narrow QRS tachycardia. As I told, we have two options, regular and irregular. Can you tell me one example for narrow QRS or regular tachycardia, which is very frequently we will see in the emergency room. Can you tell me one example? One example. The most common example of an irregular tachycardia is atrial fibrillation. So atrial fibrillation. So what is atrial fibrillation? It is a narrow complex irregular tachycardia. Now there are other features of atrial fibrillation which we will discuss later. But you understand that what is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is basically a narrow QRS tachycardia which is irregular. So that is for the time being you have to understand. So narrow complex irregular tachycardia example is atrial fibrillation. And also you can have another tachycardia called as multifocal atrial tachycardia match. We will call it as multifocal atrial tachycardia. This abnormality and these features I will discuss you in later because it is going to be too much for you for in a single class. So just understand that an irregular narrow complex tachycardia, basically you can have the most common one is atrial fibrillation and other one is multifocal atrial tachycardia. Just remember these two things. What are the examples for regular ones? The most common one is sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia, then you have something called as supraventricular tachycardia SVT. So when you call it as SVT, what is an SVT? SVT is a narrow complex regular tachycardia. There are other morphological features of SVT that I am not going to discuss right now. Just for the clarification you have to remember that whenever you see a tachycardia you have to see the QRS complex and you have to see the QRS complex and you have to decide what? Whether it is narrow QRS or wide QRS. When it is narrow QRS or wide QRS, the next thing what you have to see, whether it is a regular or irregular. If it is regular, narrow QRS, you have two options, sinus tachycardia and supraventricular tachycardia. When it is irregular, the most common one is atrial fibrillation, also multifocal atrial tachycardia. For the time being, you remember this much. Okay. So now, what we have done, so we can we have go, we can go to the other side, that is the wide QRS or wide complex tachycardia. So as I told, it can have two, it can have what regular and irregular. 
so regular and irregular so why complex tachycardia regular and irregular this is what is important for us for our acls learning so this is very important when you are dealing with a patient with cardiac arrest because both ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia both are white complex tachycardia for what you have to remember both ventricular fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia both are white complex tachycardias and ventricular tachycardia is a regular one and ventricular fibrillation is an irregular one so what you have to understand you have a patient who had a cardiac arrest so we'll go back to the scenario where we have started we had a patient with cardiac arrest where we started resuscitating him and we have started cpr at a ratio of 30 is to 2 and 30 is to 2 the moment a defibrillator is available you have connected to the defibrillator and you have checked whether it is a short couple rhythm or it is a non short couple rhythm so we have to differentiate between a shock coupled and a non shock coupled rhythm so what are the examples of a shock coupled rhythm you have two examples that you can remember is pulseless ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation rest everything is a non shock coupled rhythm whether you see it's a pea or whether it is an asystole both are non shock coupled rhythm so now we have to see how the ecg will look like how the ecg will look like in a white complex tachycardia for vf and vt so vf i told it is irregular and VT, it is regular. So that is how we have to differentiate. So you have seen a patient, you have connected the defibrillator, and you are seeing a white complex tachycardia. Whether it is regular or irregular, what is it? It is a shockable rhythm. It is a shockable rhythm. The moment you see a white complex rhythm in a cardiac arrest, and the patient is in cardiac arrest, it's a white complex rhythm. It is a shockable rhythm. So what you have to immediately deliver, you have to defibrillate the patient. So that is the reason why we have come across all those things. So just seeing any rhythm, you cannot shock whether it is a white complex rhythm, can be regular or irregular, that doesn't matter. Both are shock of rhythms. VF and VT both are shock of rhythms. So when you see a white complex rhythm in a cardiac arrest, you the patient needs to be delivered defibrillation. Okay. <clears throat> so now you'll see how the ECG will look like. So three, four things I have told, right? Four things. One is ventricular tachycardia, other one is ventricular fibrillation. And other one is PEA and other one is asystole. So we have to understand that how this ECG will look like. So as I told, what is ventricular tachycardia? It is a wide complex tachycardia. Whether it is regular or irregular? Regular. So it will be a regular tachycardia like this. So what you are able to see? The RR interval is regular and there will not be any P wave seen. So the impulse is getting generated from the ventricle. So, if the impulse is getting generated from the ventricle, what will happen? You will not get any P wave. So, normally, when you have a conduction system of the heart, so this is how the conduction system works. You have the SI node, you have the AV node, you have the bundle of his, left bundle, right bundle, both the side, left anterior fascicle and left posterior fascicle. This is how the impulse is getting generated. So, an impulse is getting generated from the SI node to AV node and you have a P wave. Okay. And the further the impulse travel towards the bundle of this, you will get a QRS complex and repolarization, you will give an ST segment and a T wave. So this is how normally an ECG is formed. So right now what is happening, it is a ventricular tachycardia. So the impulse is getting generated either from the right ventricle or it is getting generated from the left ventricle. So you will not have any P wave because the impulse is generating from the ventricle. When you have getting an impulse getting generated from the ventricle, you will not have a P wave. So that P wave will not be seen in the ECG. So instead of that, what will happen? An impulse, for example, I will just read right. For example, I will just show you the ventricle alone. So this is the ventricle. This is the right and left ventricle. Imagine this is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle. Okay. So suppose there is an the patient had a myocardial infarction and he has developed a scar in his myocardium. Okay. A scar in this myocardium and there is a scar here. Imagine there is a scar here. So this scar will start generating some impulse. So what will happen? This scar will generate some impulse and this impulse will get transmitted to the left ventricle. So an impulse is getting transmitted from the right ventricle and it is passing to the left ventricle. Normally what is happening? An impulse is coming down and simultaneously both the ventricles are stimulated. That is what is happening normally. But here what is happening? From one ventricle, the impulse is getting generated and it is going to the other ventricle. So there is a time delay for the impulse to reach the ventricle. 
if it is reaching both the ventricles simultaneously, we'll have a normal QRS. If the time taken for the impulse to generate from one ventricle to another ventricle is prolonged, you will get a void QRS. That is the reason why you are getting a void QRS. Suppose you have a normally, you have an SA node and the AV node, it is coming down. So at that time, it will go to the bundle of his simultaneously and you will get a normal QRS. But here what is happening, an impulse is generating from the right ventricle or it can be from the left ventricle and after one ventricle, the other ventricle is getting stimulated. So the time taken is more. So that is the reason why when you look into right bundle branch block or left bundle branch block, you have a white QRS because there is a block in one of the pathway. So if there is block in one of the pathway, what will happen? One pathway, one ventricle will get stimulated first and from that ventricle, it will go to the other ventricle. So that is why you have a white QRS in right ventricle branch block and left ventricle branch block. So when you have a normal pathway, you will have a normal QRS. When there is a white QRS means, what does that mean? One ventricle is stimulated first and then only the other ventricle is stimulated. That's the only thing. So what you have seen is that we can have a ventricular tachycardia. You can have <coughs> regular complexes. So this is how ventricular tachycardia you can have regular complexes and this RR interval, this RR interval will be regular. So this is ventricular tachycardia. So what will be the ECG finding in ventricular tachycardia? It is a white complex tachycardia which is regular with absent P waves. There is no P waves, only there is QRS complex. So this is ventricular tachycardia. What I can add one more adjective to it. I can add one more adjective. What is that? See the morphology of all QRS complex look alike. It looks same, right? It looks like a same throughout. This looks like this, this looks like everything is the same. So what I can call it as morphologically it is the same. So only one type I am able to see the morphology. So I can call it as monomorphic. Monomorphic means only one type. Monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Understood? <coughs> Why it is called as a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia? Because you have only got one QRS morphology. You are, you are able to see only one QRS morphology. So we can call it as monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. So when there is a mono, definitely there is a poly. When why we want to call a mono again? So whenever there is a mono, there is always a poly. So what is polymorphic? You have varying morphology of the QRS complex. So you can have something like this. I will do it again. Okay. So. See here, it is again white QRS complex, but the morphology is not the same. So, this is called as polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, or otherwise it can be called as torsade. So, torsade is pointless, that is otherwise called as Torsade is pointless. What is torsade is pointless? It is simple. It is polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. So what is ventricular tachycardia? It is a white complex regular tachycardia. It can be of two types. It can be monomorphic or it can be polymorphic. So when you see any white complex rhythm in a cardiac arrest, you can deliver the shock. So that is how a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia and a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia will look like. Now we will go to the next thing that is ventricular fibrillation. So what is ventricular fibrillation? It is again a white complex tachycardia, but it is irregular. So it is pretty simple. It is pretty simple like you write in your handwriting towards the end of the exam. This is how I have to read. This is what you will be reading in the writer. That is ventricular fibrillation. Easy to remember. It is a white complex tachycardia which is irregular. So <coughs> ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation. <coughs> PEA, what is PEA? PEA doesn't have what I need rhythm. Whatever rhythm you are seeing, anything other than, suppose you are seeing something like this, okay? Or suppose you are just seeing some QRS complex or maybe some P wave only, but there is no palpable pulse. Whichever rhythm other than this VF and VT, you are seeing in the ECG. When you are connected to the defibrillator, you are seeing some rhythm, but it is not VF or VT. Any other rhythm is seen and you have checked for the pulse, there is no pulse. You can call it as pulseless electrical activity. So that is basically pulseless electrical activity. As a study, it is pretty simple. It is a straight line in the ECG. You have to understand that it is a continuous straight line. So when the defibrillator is not connected properly, you will also get a straight line. But that will be 
a dotted line. So you have to differentiate when you see a dotted line, that doesn't mean it is a history. When you see a dotted line, that means the defibrillator is not properly connected. You have to go back and connect the defibrillator properly. So this is a history. <coughs> Any rhythm other than VFVT without absent pulse, we can hold as pulseless electrical activity. And irregular QRS complex, white QRS complex, we can call it as VF and VT, which is a white complex tachycardia, which is regular. So these two are shockable and these are not shockable rhythms. So you should not use defibrillation. So clear? So what we have discussed today? We have discussed, we have gone, started with BLS, review of BLS and from BLS, we have started the CPR 30 to 2 compression. The moment a defibrillator is available, we have to connect to the defibrillator and see whether it is a shockable or a non-shockable rhythm. And ACLS basically comprises of delivering the shock and if it's not done in the BLS part and advanced airway and drugs. <clears throat> so what we have decided to discuss today is to differentiate between your ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation which is the two shockable rhythms and on the other side PE and asystole. Basically an approach to tachycardia. Now we will discuss other tachycardias like whatever we have discussed later we will discuss in the continuation of ACLS. For today's class we will stop here. Okay. Thank you.